I would I like a testimony to have some credibility. Amen. I don't like a testimony to be theoretical. <laughs> That's not real effective, is it? Well, I heard that Jesus can save. What yeah. kind of a testimony yeah. is that? I read it. <laughs> yeah, I read about it, heard about it somewhere yeah. in Sunday school or something. No, somebody that has a living testimony. And, uh, you know, nobody can ever tell me that God is the healer, that he's not my savior. Nobody can ever tell me that because I know for myself. Amen. I think that's why this church loves that song so much. Uh, yes, I know Jesus. Because it resonates with us. I don't have to ask anybody else. I don't have, this is not theoretical for me. This isn't something I'm hoping to experience one day. But this is something that I have experienced and that I know for myself. And so that brings us right into tonight's Bible study because hearing from God in so many different people's lives is theoretical. I am overwhelmed when I hear uh, church people of all kinds of different denominations talk about hearing from God. And, and they, they speak about it as something that maybe someday can be obtained if you go your entire life through just right and you're a good enough person, then maybe someday you know, you'll have some experience somehow where you'll hear something from God. And that's how the world, even the church world at large, the non-Pentecostal folks, and, and I talk about Pentecost a lot. It's not to alienate. It's because I think everybody needs to have the Holy Ghost. Yeah. I believe that the word Christian means Pentecostal. I really do. I think that in the New Testament, it was synonymous. The word Christian didn't mean a hundred different denominations, and some of them believe this and some of them. No, in the New Testament church, all you had to say is Christian, and they knew that was a tongue-talking bunch of Holy Ghost-filled people that heard from God. That's what they knew. That's what they knew, because that's the way it was. You read the book of Acts, there's not one church that wasn't absolutely filled with the Holy Ghost. So, you know, we come into modern times and we think, oh, well, this group over here, they, you know, believe this and they believe. No, there's only one church. That's what the word says. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. <laughs> Amen. And, and the church is, uh, is one. Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church. And that's the only church that makes any difference is the church that belongs to Jesus because he is the head of the body, right? And so, uh, so I just kind of want to make that clear. When I talk about Pentecost, I'm not doing that to divide. I'm just talking about, you know, of course, uh, we know what that means, Pentecostal doctrine. But when we talk about and we teach Pentecostal doctrine, we're just teaching the, the gospel, the, the doctrine of the new church, the New Testament church. That's all there is to it. Okay, so we don't teach this part for the Baptists and this part for the Pentecostals and this part for the Methodists and this part for the Episcopals and catch the Catholics over here and all these different things. No, it's just all the same teaching. It's whether you want to receive it or not. Okay, and the same is true with God speaking to us. Now, this, this three-part series is on uh, hearing the voice of God. And uh, last week, how many were here last week? Amen. Wow, almost everybody. Um, and so last week, uh, we're, we're trying. Julie did record it, and we're trying to uh, work out maybe getting that available, making that available. Um, so we'll we'll try and work on that. Uh, if she can get it to me, maybe we can make that happen. But um, I don't want to spend time reviewing tonight because we've got so much to cover uh, for tonight's part of uh, the Bible study. But we are uh, doing this in three different parts. Um, and last time, last Wednesday. We just talked about three main principles. And remember the scripture told us that you're, you're dull of hearing, Paul was saying to the church. He was saying you're dull of hearing, and you need to get back to the first principles of what? Does anybody remember? The first principles of what? Uh, Nobody? God. Anybody? God. God. The oracles of God. Oracles. oracles. Yeah. Anybody remember that? Yep. You know, I, I don't know, words, words remind me of things, and when I, Oracle reminds me of Orca, for some reason, a big killer whale, right? And so that's what I picture, and, and that's how I remember Oracle. <laughs> Whatever works, right? What is an Oracle? Somebody tell me. It's an utterance from God. It's an utterance from God. So the word of God that is uttered. Logos is the, the what? 
It's the written word of God, okay? And we went, we went all through that last week uh, about God's written word. And, uh, and, but we're talking about the uttered word of God. In other words, this is something he's speaking directly to his people. So what I'd like for us to do is uh, I'm going to introduce another word to you that maybe you've never heard before. Um, turn with me. We're going to go together into two passages, and then I'm going to ask for some help reading. Uh, but let's first go to 1 John 2.20. 1 John 2.20. And uh, uh, again, I'd like uh, some help, but I only want help with King James Version. So if you have a different version, please grab the Bible under the pew in front of you. And there's a reason that I do this. Uh, if we get into all kinds of murky translations, you know, there are agendas behind some of the translations. I'm not going to spend time talking about the ones I like and the ones I don't like, but did you know that most of those translations that are so popular would condemn you to hell? Because they say, literally, that you're going to hell if you're homosexual. So uh, there are things that I disagree with in those versions. Um, doesn't mean that there's not good in them, but for teaching purposes, that's why we're going to use King James Version. It's the, the closest to the original text in the English language, so that's... That's exactly why I'm, uh, you know, pretty adamant about that. Uh, if you have questions about that, there's an entire class that you can take on uh, versions of the Bible and why the King James Version is accurate, uh, mostly accurate. There are some issues, uh, but compared to everything else. I once, in another church, uh, because I preach only from the King James Version, I once had somebody say, well, you only like the King James Version because you don't want anybody else to understand the Bible. You just want to, you've, you've had training and you, you understand it, but you don't want anybody else to, no, I just want you to understand the real word of God, not somebody else's idea of watered down doctrine. And so that's what this is all about. Uh, you know, just because uh, the word of God, the Bible, uh, Paul said to Timothy, study to show yourself approved. So you need to study the word of God. You need, if you don't understand it, study it. Don't uh, depend on somebody else. There's nothing wrong with using other people's works. But you better go to the word first and then use the other works, you know, as uh, something to consider. So that's why uh, that's I just wanted to mention that because I don't often take the time to explain why uh, why we do that here. I so James yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I particularly uh, really dislike the NIV and that is probably the most popular version in the church world. But it coincides with the watered-down doctrine that is prevalent in the church world as well. And we could go through all kinds of examples of that. But the NIV is anti-Holy Ghost. The NIV is anti-gay. The NIV is anti-holiness. So there you go. That was free. Okay. Um, so we're in uh, 1 John 2.20. And uh, so here's what it says. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Hallelujah. Hmm. So, do we have any know-it-alls here? <laughs> well, the Bible said that I know all things. <laughs> but what? It, in order to understand this passage, we have to know what an unction is. How many have never heard the word unction before? Never, heard the word never unction. in your life heard the word unction. And you didn't know it was so all of you, all the rest of you have heard it. <laughs> okay. Smart again. I'll tell you. I heard it here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, because I wasn't raised, uh, you know, this wasn't a popular scripture when I was raised. I wasn't. I didn't hear this uh, scripture until I was a teenager. I hadn't read the Bible through, so I didn't know it was in here. And so I began to wonder what an unction is. And it's very, very uh, relevant to what we're talking about in this Bible study. An unction, when you uh, look in the Greek, it is a specific anointing to hear the oracles of God. That's what an unction is. And so uh, here we are. John is very specifically addressing exactly what we're studying, what we're talking about. And here's what he says. He says, you don't have to worry about trying to figure out a way to hear God because you have an unction. Hallelujah. You have a Holy Ghost anointing to hear the utterance of God. Now we know that the Holy Ghost 
uh, we talked about the written word a lot last week, and we know that God has already anointed his written word. And But how about that? We have scripture that absolutely proves to us in no uncertain terms that not only do we have the ability to hear from God, but we have the anointing from the Holy Ghost in a specific anointing to hear from God. So when the enemy comes around and says, well, you, you can't hear from God. You know, how many times have we been frustrated because we feel like we can't hear the voice of God? I know many, many people have come to me over the years, and that was their very issue. And, and they, had, they came up against a brick wall in, in living for God because they, they couldn't communicate. They, you know, they would pray, but they didn't know how to hear from God. So I want you to understand that regardless of your past frustrations, regardless of your confusion and your doubt on this subject, the Word of God declares to you that there's an anointing upon you to hear His utterance, the oracles of God. Praise God. And His Word will break every yoke of bondage. His Word, His truth, when you know it, will make you free. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So you've got to first know the truth, and that's why this is so important to study the Word of God and know what the Word says, because there is a liberty in this, uh, in understanding what the Word has to say. So our word for tonight is, is unction. <laughs> unction. You have an unction. Okay, it is a specific anointing to hear the oracles of God. Now, uh, we spent a lot of time on this, but I do want to repeat it as we uh, move into tonight's uh, Bible study. Uh, we, the way that we're dividing this up, for those who were not here last week, is we talked about the, the first principles last week of hearing from God. And tonight, we're going to specifically address, how do I know this is God? How do I know this is God? Okay? And there is so much... Uh, that the word has to say about this. And then next week, we're specifically going to address hearing from God for other people. Hearing from God for other people. Brother and Sister Shave, I just want to say how much I appreciate you being here tonight. Because I know that you were traveling and out of town over the weekend. I know that how difficult that can be. And then here you are back. And I know you're leaving again for next weekend to minister. So uh, tomorrow morning. So I just want to say, I know how easy and what a good reason you would have for not being here. But I, I appreciate the effort. We knew you wouldn't accept the reason. <laughs> <laughs> And, and that goes also for Sister Diane. How many of us would be in urgent yeah. care yeah. earlier in the evening? Yeah. And she didn't just show up for Bible study. She came in practice. So, mm -hmm. folks, this is, I, I can't even tell you. You know, when I begin to see people uh, that are taking on uh, what the Word says about faithfulness, mm -hmm. taking it on themselves, not because... I had to call Sister Diane and said, now I know you've been, and you know, God's a healer to get to church. <laughs> that's, that's not, you know, this is, a, this is really, I'm touched, and I, I appreciate it. I really I wanted to make, um, let you know that. I, I just feel like I got to get here. Maybe, maybe everybody should know, I told Pastor last week, this is one of probably the most, one of the most important Bible studies that he's ever taught anywhere. You know, I don't think you've taught this before, particularly, but especially for this church body right now. Extremely vital, important. All right. Let's turn together to John. Now, we did cover this. Um, uh, oh, I was talking about the different um, divisions for the night. So tonight we're talking about, is this really the voice of God? How do I know this is God? Next week is going to be very, very important as well. It's going to be hearing from God for other people. It's going to include dreams and visions and prophecy and the various gifts of the Spirit and other ways of hearing from God. So uh, it's going to be very, very important. Um, help me pray that those that need to be uh, in that Bible study will be in that Bible study. I made it very clear that if you plan to operate in the gifts in this church that you need to be in that teaching. I wanted people, of course, to be in all of this teaching, but uh, help me pray that God will convict those that, that need to be here that are not. Um, okay, so John 10, uh, verses 4 and 5. John 10, let's all turn to this one, and uh, this is something that we did cover last week, but I kind of want to go back to it just for a minute. 
because uh, we're talking about how do I know that the voice that I'm hearing is the voice of God. So say amen when you have John 10, verse 4. Okay. And by the way, uh, Nate told me that um, I get so excited and, and, and commanding in this Bible study that maybe people don't know that they can speak up and share. And so I want to make clear that, uh, as I said last week, this, this place is full tonight of experts on this subject, whether you know it or not. From the day that you were saved and began a relationship with the Lord, you've been involved in what we're studying. So if you want to share, um, then you know I want you to understand that I'm, I, I want that, okay? So I want you to participate. John, the 10th chapter, and verse 4. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. Now, I could preach all over again about this, <laughs> but this just keeps coming up. I, I preached about this on Sunday, about the Lord is before all things. So the, sh the shepherd, it goes before the sheep. Hallelujah. Maybe I'm the one that needs to hear this because it just keeps coming up. Whatever it is that you're walking into, the shepherd has already been there and already worked it out for you. Hallelujah. So the shepherd is before the sheep. And the sheep follow him, and they know his voice. Yeah. They know his voice. And not only that, they know his voice so well that verse 5 says, A stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of the stranger. Amen. So that's what this is all about, is coming to a place where we know his voice so well <laughs> that we're able to follow him. And we talked about this last week simply by hearing his voice. There are times that I can't see my way. Right? Anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about? There are times that there's so much confusion in my life. That there are times that I'm in the midnight hour. There are times that my eyes are full of tears and I can't see because I'm going through some time where there's some sorrow. You know, the Bible said weeping may endure for the night. It doesn't say you're not going to cry. The Word doesn't say you're not going to have heartache. The Word never says that you're going to be spared from, uh, from those things. But we do have the promise that joy is going to come in the morning. Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, that's a promise that the world doesn't have. That's right. They're going to go on and have to deal with their situation without God. Mm -hmm. But we have the promise that it can only last through the night. Because joy is going to come in the morning. So uh, it is so crucial that we are able. What, are we going to just stop following the Lord because we can't see him? All right. No, we need to be so in tune with his voice that we can hear and we have the ability to continue to follow him even when we can't see the way before our eyes. Because the just live by what? And we don't walk by sight. But we walk by faith. And so part of being able to walk by faith is being able to hear his voice. And, uh, and so we know that we, if we can develop that connection with him so that we know his voice, then we can, we can know that we're going the right direction, not only because we hear his voice and can identify his voice, but also we're not going to follow anybody in the wrong direction because we're not going to follow the voice of a stranger. We're going to deal with that uh, in depth tonight. How do I know that this is God? How do I know this is the voice of God? Okay, so I'm going to need some help here. Um, I need some nice, strong uh, readers. 1 Kings 19, 11 through 2. Who's got that? Okay, Glenn. Um, I need James 4, 8. I'm going to take volunteers until there aren't any, and then I'll start calling on you. And since some of you weren't here last week, you ought to be the first to volunteer. <laughs> James 4, 8. Okay, Julie. Hebrews 11, 6. Okay, Drew. <laughs> Isaiah 55, 3. Okay, that would be Latricia. <laughs> Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Would you get that, Nate? I'm sorry, what was that? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. And Trish, you were 55, 3. And then, um, let's see. Jasmine 55, 11. Okay. And then one more. Who will get uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, Brother Tim? Okay, so let's go to 1 Kings 19, 11, and 12. 
said, Go forth and stand up on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake, the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. All right, this is Jeremiah. And he's talking about his experience in hearing the voice of God. Okay, so how many know that the, the, the Lord can Elijah? That's right. Okay, and, and so he's talking about hearing the voice of God. And uh, he's, how many know that God can speak in various ways in our lives? Yes. That he can speak in a great loud way. He can speak in the earthquake. He can speak in uh, you know all kinds of different ways that are unmistakable. But when it comes down to it, most of the time, he's going to speak in that still small voice. Okay, why would that be? Why would God choose? And by the way, it's very clear here that um, the the Lord did pass by, and so. The, the mountains that were rent and broken pieces, the rocks coming down, the earthquake that happened, those were a result of God. So that, it wasn't that it wasn't God, it's just that what he was speaking came in a still small voice. Why is it that God would choose to speak to us in a still small voice, anybody? Say that again. Okay, okay. I don't, you know, if, if there's an earthquake, it's going to get my attention pretty fast. I don't have to really concentrate on that, do I? <laughs> there's, uh, the mountains are, are coming down around me. I don't have to really pay much attention to that. It's going to get my attention and everything else is going to fall into the background. But a still small voice requires me to initiate that ability to hear. I'm going to have to tune out everything else. And I'm going to have to take some time to get quiet. Because if I allow everything else to be loud in my life, God, here's what it comes down to. God is not interested in competing for your time. Amen. He's not invasive. He's not interested in competing for your time. So if you, and we're talking about people who are already saved, okay? So I, I, I want you to be clear. We're not talking about unsaved people. God will do whatever it takes to, uh, to draw you into a place of salvation. But we're talking about people that are saved hearing from God. So we have to initiate the uh, communication. And I'm going to show you some scripture. Did you want to say something else? That's right. And, uh, and we're going to talk about the different voices and, uh, and, and the things that are competing for uh, the bandwidth, if you want to put it that way. Uh, because we only have, we're human beings trying to tap into the realm of the Spirit. That's what's going on here. We are human beings trying to tap into the realm of the Spirit. And we talked about last week that hearing from God is a spiritual experience. It's not a natural experience. It's a spiritual experience. So, uh, so that's why it doesn't come natural to the carnal man, but we have to step into the realm of the Spirit. And so uh, go ahead and read James 4 and verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. All right. So there are two parts of this that are very important for us to know. First off, God doesn't say, I'm going to draw close to you so that you can get close to me, does he? That's not, you know, if we're not careful, we smush everything together and, and just make it a big, you know, glob of scripture and we don't get the sequence right. And God is very meticulous in his word. There is a sequence that goes on. And that sequence is, I want my people to initiate closeness and, and drawing near to me, and then I will respond and draw near to them. So if we want to hear from the Lord, the first thing is uh, that we need to 
uh, we need to initiate that process. How many, uh, how many remember when I said last week that God is already speaking to you? He's already speaking to you. And so the initiation is not saying, God, will you please speak to me? But it's initiating my own process of becoming quiet and, and keying in, drawing near to him by, uh, by hearing the correct voice. And that's what we're talking about. How do I know this is God? When I begin to hear a message, and uh, we remember um, the last, you know, I started with that story about having the radio, and, and I had the different voices coming through the radio, and, and how do I know that that yes. voice is yes. the correct voice? So that's what we're talking about. So God desires that we initiate closeness with Him, and then He's going to draw near to us. And, and then uh, the, the last part of that verse uh, says that we need to cleanse our hands. And that we need to be careful about having a double mind. Now, why is that relevant to what we're talking about? It says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. It didn't say purify your hearts, you uh, anything else, right. you know, you, you horrible sinner. It's, it said, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, but purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Now, the reason that this is so relevant is because... We're going to see in just a minute that God speaks to us through our minds. Your mind is the medium of communication between you and God. And that's what the still small voice is all about. A still small voice is not something that you're going to hear um, because you've got a Bluetooth on and uh, <laughs> you, know, you have the ability to just have, you know, have it come through. No, it is going to take place in your spirit and the only way, because we have flesh suits on, uh, the only way that we can actually process something happening, happening in our spirit is it's got to come through our mind. And so our mind has to process it so that we can, uh, you know, we can take that message and do something with it so that we can, com communication is a two-way street. Right. And so if we're going to communicate with the Lord, we, we need to, we know how to say uh, things to God often, but we don't know how to have that two-way communication with Him. Right. Okay, so it's taking place in our minds and we need to be single in our mind, not double-minded. Right. The Word of God said, in Proverbs that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And that's why uh, that, that, that stability requires that you have singleness of mind. It's because you can't allow all of the background noise to go on if you really want to hear the voice of God. So, uh, yes? Well, this verse that you just read about um, where the first half is talking to sinners. The second half Maybe you can correct me, but will <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. But the second half seems to be talking to those who have the ability to not to be on the spiritual plane as well as the the natural plane, as opposed to the sinner who is just unless God is calling the sinner to Him or has a specific purpose. Actually, this is not talking to people who don't know God because. Cleansing your hands doesn't bring salvation. Um, so salvation comes from being washed in the blood, but cleansing your hands is talking about holiness. And so although we, uh, when we're saved, we are washed in the blood, but we're still sinners saved by grace. So this is talking about, uh, this. James is talking to um, those who have been saved uh, that need to cleanse their hands and to become holy. Um, you know, the bride has made herself ready. And, and so part of that process is cleansing your hands uh, and, and walking rightly before God. But then the other part of that is having your mind single before God so that you can communicate with him. So um, let's move on to Hebrews 11.6. For without faith, faith, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is, that he has a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay, so we're talking about the principle of God responding Amen. to those who make, who initiate and press in and diligently seek him. Diligently means I didn't just 
you know, go to the altar once and say, Lord, I, I just want to live for you and I give you everything and hallelujah. And get up and just, you know, and then a year goes by. No, diligently seek him, seeking him, diligence requires that you're continually making an effort. Yes. Absolutely. Discipline in seeking after him. Now, we're not going to spend any more time on this, but when, if you uh, begin to read the Psalms of David, uh, David said, early will I seek him. David said, you've asked me to seek your face, and my response was, Lord, I will seek your face. So God responds to those who initiate communication and initiate closeness, initiate and seek after him diligently, not just once, but continually. That's how you're going to know God. That's why the vast majority of those, you know, we talk about uh, salvation is free, but discipleship is going to cost you everything you've got. <laughs> because there aren't a whole lot of people that are interested in discipleship. Discipleship is a close relationship with the Lord, walking with him daily, just as the disciples did uh, when they walked with him on earth. But there are, most, I would say, Christians want to have an experience that gets them out of judgment, and then they want to go on and walk on their own pathway and just have sort of a standoff relationship with the Lord. But I don't believe that anyone with a standoff relationship with him is going to be in the bride of Christ. I believe he's coming back for somebody who is in love, a bride who is in love with him. Amen. You believe that? He's coming back for a bride that's in love with him. And, and, you know, it's not hard to fall in love with the Lord. All you have to do is spend time with him. How can you not love him when you just begin to spend time, just begin to get to know him a little bit? And you know what? Every single day that I spend with him, I'm more in love with him than I ever was. I, I don't even know how that's possible. But after all these years and here, you know, we've got... I, I, the shades are not in their heads, and I know Pastor Morgan believes the same way, and they've known God longer than I've been alive, and yet they're still falling in love with the Lord over and over and deeper and deeper. So that's, that's the relationship that he wants. And how many know that there isn't a relationship that will work without communication? If you've ever been in one, you know. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So, uh, so we need to understand that if you're not close to God, then what do we need to do? We need to be the ones to start drawing near to him. And then he promised that he would draw near to you. Okay, so God uh, speaks quietly through our thoughts. Although with experience... And with time, remember the scripture that we used last week, Paul said the reason you're dull of hearing is you haven't put in the time, and you haven't exercised your senses. And so uh, uh, for those that weren't here, let me just give you that reference so that you, it's, a, it's a powerful scripture. Um, that passage was Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 5.11. Okay, and uh, 5.11 uh, through 14. And so... Uh, so we know that exercising our spiritual senses is necessary if we're going to really hear the voice of God, be able to have that two-way communication. But, uh, and so he's going to speak to us with a still small voice, but I will tell you this, that with experience in hearing that still small voice, sometimes that still small voice will sound like an earthquake in your spirit. My life the first time. Changed my life. Absolutely. There are times that I have heard from God in that still small voice, but it literally shook my spirit. There have been many times it shook me. And, and it almost, now I've never heard the audible voice of God. Some people have heard that. How many know there was a man named Saul who was on the road to Damascus, and God spoke to him in an audible voice? As a matter of fact, it didn't stop with just an audible voice. I don't know how earth-shattering the voice of God would sound. I've got to imagine the voice of God would just take you apart at the, at the you know, cellular level <laughs> just to hear his, voice, his audible voice like that. But, but Saul was riding along on his donkey and he'd been killing Christians and persecuting the church and doing what he thought God wanted him to do. And, and he heard the audible voice of God. And not only that, but the Spirit of God, as a great light, shone down on him and knocked him clear off of his donkey onto the ground. Wow. 
Right. That was what communication with God was for him. Now, let me ask somebody, uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe this will dawn on you because I had to think about it for a minute. Why would God speak to Saul in such an earth-shattering manner uh, to speak to him with an audible voice and knock him off of his donkey and onto the ground with a blinding light? He was, he was blind for three days after that situation. Now, why would God do that for Saul, and yet the rest of us get this little, still, small voice that we have to learn to hear, and we, we have to quiet believe. down? Well, we already believe. There you go. <laughs> Boom. There it is. <laughs> That's exact. She said, because we already believe. It's, it's because, and, and Paul was not filled with the Holy Ghost on that road to Damascus. As a matter of fact, there was a man named Ananias who'd been fasting and God spoke to him and he said, go down to the road and I'm going to put you in touch with a man named Saul. And so, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but it's an exciting story in the book of Acts if you want to get into it. Uh, but but he, this earth-shattering communication with Saul you know, he spoke and conversed with God. He said, who art thou, Lord? And, and God spoke from heaven and said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Can you imagine not only are you hearing from the God of your fathers, but he's saying, I'm the one you're persecuting, stupid. Quit killing my servants. Quit killing my people. And you're blind and you're laying there and, you, you know, you're having this experience. But you know what? Here comes a man named Ananias. Now, he, I, he, oh, there's so much in this. And I, I want to move on, but this is so exciting. God could have just went ahead and laid out the plan of salvation for Saul, couldn't he? Mm -hmm. Saul wasn't saved yet just because he heard the voice of God. Yeah. But he wasn't filled with the Holy Ghost yet just because he heard the voice of God. But the Bible said that a man who was fasting named Ananias heard from the Holy Ghost and went where he was called to go, heard the voice of God and obeyed the voice of God. And my Lord, I can't imagine a better convert to have under your belt as a soul winning badge than Saul, who became Paul, who had such an anointing on him, became an apostle of Jesus Christ, laid hands on the sick, raised the dead, wrote the New Testament, most of it. My goodness. Simply because he was fasting, Ananias, and heard the voice of God. And when he said, laid his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. God changed his name from Saul to Paul. Amen. He had a, a, an experience that just changed everything. But why didn't God just go ahead and lay everything out? Why didn't he say, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. Here's the way of salvation. Do this and then do this and then do this. No, but you, he sent somebody to preach the gospel. God didn't preach the gospel directly to Saul. It came through the born again. Those who had the word of reconciliation laid upon them. Amen. There's a lot in that. So, uh, but we need to move on. Uh, so God wants to speak through you. Next week, we're going to specifically talk about hearing from God for others. So, uh, so but what happened when you read the story uh, all the way through, it talks about uh, Ananias laid his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And you know what he did then? He went and got baptized. Yeah. Amen. So uh, he went through the same experience as we do today. He was part of that same church, and he was uh, part of that same experience that you and I have today. Praise God. So, uh, but, but God now is interested in speaking to us because we're believers, because we're filled with the Spirit. He wants us to be so close to him that we can hear his voice. All right, so... Uh, Isaiah 55 and verse 3. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even as your mercies of David. All right. He said, incline your ear. What does that mean? <coughs> incline your ear. Incline means to, to reposition, right? To, to move. Incline would mean, you know, to raise it up. But to, you know, and sometimes... Uh, when you hear people, or you see people rather, that uh, are a little bit hard of hearing in one ear versus the other, you know, they have a little bit of an issue on one side versus the other, what do they do? Yeah. 
You ever seen someone do that? You're talking to them and they do this, or, or is this one they, you know, they'll just automatically, they don't even know they're doing it. But they're so used to changing the position of their ear so that they can hear you better. And that's what Isaiah is talking about here. He's saying, you need to position yourself so that you can hear from God. How many know that you can be in a place, a physical place, that you're not supposed to be, and God is trying to speak to you, and you're not going to be able to hear him if you're in a place where you don't belong? All right, yeah. mm -hmm. Take that for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. Amen. How many know that you can be in the middle of a situation trying to work something out that doesn't belong to you, yeah. And you're carrying the weight of the world and the cares of the world when you know good and well that the Bible says that we have to cast our cares upon him. And everything is so loud and, and just so confusing and, and so, so much turmoil that we can't hear anything. Amen. Why? Because we're not positioned correctly to hear. And so Isaiah said we need to first incline our ear to hear. So that was uh, Isaiah 55 and 3. Incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live. And then I'll make, uh, I will um, make a covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Okay, read, uh, who has verses 8 and 9? Same chapter. 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. That is for sure. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Okay. okay. Now, we've established that God wants to speak to you through the still small voice, which is in, speak to your spirit, but it's going to come through your thoughts. Okay? Now, this is something I want you to hear loud and clear. And we're going to get into this in depth. But we need to be very careful because anytime that we deal with our thoughts, we're entering into the battleground of the mind. That's right. We are involving the battleground of the mind. Right. Okay, we're going to talk about that. But Understand this, that when the Lord speaks to us, he doesn't require that you understand what he's speaking. Amen. In fact, sometimes he's going to speak to you specifically something that you don't comprehend. Right. His ways are above our ways. And his thoughts are above our thoughts. Does that mean that simply because my mind can't comprehend what he's saying to me, that it's not the word of God? Right. Does that mean that I should just throw away what the Lord is speaking to me because I can't quite comprehend what he's saying? No, there are things, his ways are above your ways. You know, what we want to do is we want to filter everything that he speaks to us through our intellect and God doesn't require that your intellect is able to grasp what he's saying to you. There are many times that God wants to speak directly to your spirit and bypass your intellect. Right. How many know that that's possible? Right. Yeah. Right. That God many times will bypass your understanding and bypass your intellect and speak directly to your spirit. But in order for us to be able to receive that, we have to have a level of trust in our shepherd that when we hear his voice, we're not going to question and say, well, Lord, I realize that this is the genuine voice of the shepherd and, and I've been walking with you long enough that I've developed that relationship with you and I hear your voice and I've authenticated your voice. You know, we've got all kinds of technology today that there are locks that you just speak to the lock and it authenticates yeah. your voice. There are uh, even computers that have voice activation and, you know, you can even get these things on your home computer where you can speak and spell and speak and control your computer and speak and the passwords are automatically put in where they're supposed to be and your voice is authenticated and so uh, so we know that this is you know not, not a pipe dream even in the world that we live in but we authenticate his voice because of the experience that we have with him but we need to be careful not to put it through the filter of our own understanding. Last week we talked about the scripture that said, 
uh, to not lean to our own understanding, to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts, lean not to your own understanding. And so our, our own understanding is often going to be the obstacle in the way of you being able to receive the word of God. Amen. Do I need to say that again? Yes. I think I do because, <laughs> listen, this stuff, you, now you know why I've been walking around like, wow, <laughs> before I ever got a chance to teach this because these are things that God was speaking to me first. And, but see, we need to understand, let me just say it one more time, that your understanding, the filter of your understanding is one of the primary obstacles to you being able to, uh, to receive the messages and the, hear the voice of God. That's right. That's right. Um, so, he doesn't require that you understand. His ways are always going to be higher than your ways. And so, the strategy that you put in place when the Lord comes and says, <laughs> yeah, that was cute. <laughs> now let me speak to you what I want you to do. Now that you put a strategy in place for me, now let me speak to you and tell you what I have in mind. Amen. Do you, do you do that? Am I the only one that tries to figure everything out for God? No. Sometimes all night long I'll be working for God, uh, you know, working, doing his job for him. <laughs> and I want to think it's working for God, but it's not the right kind of working right, for God. Right. I want to do his job for him. I want to just go over in my mind the things that I'm going to say in a certain situation and exactly what the way I'm going to deal with it. And, and God's nowhere in it. In fact, he's taking a little coffee break and said, well, if you're going to work on it, there's no sense in both of us doing it. So I'm not going to work on it. If you're, if you're wanting to do my job for me, I'm going to go over and help somebody else for a while. But, but see, when I hear from the Lord, I don't need to put that through the filter. I need to allow him to work. And oh, he knows the beginning from the end. He is the author and the finisher of my faith. And so I always, you know, I can sleep better if I get my hands off of the wheel. I can rest in my spirit when I begin to trust him that he knows what he's doing, that he's not only uh, initiated that situation in my life, but he that hath begun a good work in me shall perform it and is going to finish the work. Hallelujah. All the way up until the day of Jesus Christ. All the way up until the day that I hear the trumpet sound. He's promised me that he that began a good work is going to complete it. Hallelujah. And so I need to, uh, to focus on hearing from him. His ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are above my ways. In fact, he says that they're so high that as high as the heavens are, higher than the earth. And, and so are his ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Verse 11. Who has that? Okay, so the word of God is going to accomplish the things that God wants it to accomplish. Not necessarily what you want it to accomplish, but the things that God is concerned with accomplishing. He is going to perform it, but through his word. So, uh, so you know, that's a promise that we have. And so we need to, uh, when we hear his word, we need to just let him do the work. Just let him do the Ninety percent of my issues and my problems and my trials, I find that when I can just somehow remember to get my hands off of the, the situation, ninety percent of the time, God works it out in no time flat. And yeah. yet I prolong the situation. I anguish over the situation. I've got to process it through my emotions and through my, my mind. And I've got to, oh, Lord, I don't know how to deal with this. And I've got to lay on my face before God until I can feel okay about it. If I could just get my feelings out of the way and let God be God for half a second... That situation would be cleared up. I would be able to move on. I wouldn't be consumed with this situation. I'd be moving on to what God has for me. He's speaking to me, but I can't hear him because I'm so busy trying to do his job for him. All right. 
So not everything that gets in the way of me hearing God is evil. I'm trying to do the right thing, but my flesh gets in the way and, and I need to suspend. You know, God, God's not interested in me understanding about it. If I could just get that in my spirit. God's not interested in me understanding it. I may be able to understand it. The old song said, by and by. We'll understand it better by and by. God doesn't care about you understanding. He cares about you obeying. And if you get to a point where you hear his voice, where you can blindly say, Lord, I don't get this at all, but here I go. <laughs> here I go. Here I hear your voice, and Lord, here I go. I'm running. I preached a message recently that the word of God said that we need to, we need to run down the pathway to meet him. Run down the pathway to meet him. Lord, I'm not just going to meander around. I'm just going to run to the voice that I hear calling me. Hallelujah. So, um, so we need to uh, we need to understand that obstacle co obstacles come in all shapes and sizes, and it's not always going to be sin that divides you uh, from hearing the voice of God. Sometimes it's good intentions. So let's talk for a moment about the battleground of the mind. Why does Satan uh, fight us in our mind so desperately? It's pretty clear when we put all this together. That God is speaking to us through our mind and through our thoughts. It's pretty clear that that's where the enemy has figured out that he can attack us yeah. and be most effective and most right. efficient. If he can cause uh, uh, you know a bomb to go off in my mind and cause me to be all my attention to be diverted over here, then I've stopped hearing from God. And because I've stopped hearing His voice, I've stopped advancing toward Him. I've stopped moving toward my pathway. I've stopped moving to heavenly uh, places in God. I've stopped going and growing and, and achieving and, and, and getting to, to the things that he's promised me. I've stopped moving toward the higher anointing. I've stopped moving to blessings. I've stopped moving toward my deliverance. I've stopped moving toward my uh, ministry and the fulfillment of his promises. I've stopped in my uh, tracks because I can't hear anything that's going on. And especially if I can't see and I'm trying to go by his voice, if I can't hear his voice, then I just stop right where I'm at. So no wonder Satan has uh, puts a lot of his attention toward the battleground of the mind. Right. Who has Isaiah 55? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going through that. Um, yes, Second Corinthians ten three through five. Second Corinthians ten three through five. First, no, you walk in the flesh. We do not war after the flesh. Okay, stop. I'm going to stop you at each one, just because I want to. I want to. Uh, to talk about these. So now, this is a message we preach about, uh, a passage that we preach about all the time around here because we have to be constantly reminded. Right. By the way, you're not unique in that. Moses was constantly having to remind the people of Israel. For goodness sake, they walked through the Red Sea, parted on either side of them. They'd seen the wall of fire. They'd seen the cloud of the glory of God. They had seen uh, the, the, the soldiers drown in, as the Red Sea closed. But, I mean, miracles. They'd seen the water come out of, of the rock. They'd seen the manna. They'd seen uh, the quail come in for uh, meat. They'd seen everything that they needed. They'd seen uh, God respond to them, and yet they had to be reminded over and over and over and over. No wonder Moses threw up his hands and said, God, I, I don't know. And, and you know, uh, it, it became frustrating for Moses because... They had to be constantly reminded, even though they had seen these unbelievable miracles. How often do we come to a place where we seriously wonder if God is going to be able to get us out of this situation? I mean, really, how often do we come to a place where I don't know if there's any way out of this? Yet God saved you, washed you in his yeah. blood. Yeah. You're yeah. bought with a price. He yeah. created a miracle in your life, brought deliverance to you. Every 
everybody raised their hand that they'd been healed uh, miraculously by the hand of God. Uh, every single person in this place has seen a miraculous answer in your time of need. Uh, and yet we come to a place where we say, well, I don't know how I'm going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> But except that we get into a whining kind of an attitude, <laughs> complaining kind of an attitude, simply because we don't know how. And God doesn't require that we work it out, does he? But right. we have to know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever, that he's always going to make a way because he promised he would. So uh, we don't walk in the flesh. And so the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We war uh, after, oops, I just quoted the next verse. Uh, <laughs> you see, it's just almost automatic. I love this passage. Uh, uh, so we're, we're not walking in the flesh. So why do we think that we need to figure it out in the flesh? Why do, the, why do we think we need to make a way forward in the flesh? We're not walking in the flesh. That's not what God has called us to. So go ahead and read 4 and 5 if you would, Brother Tim. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, mm. but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Amen. Praise God. Drew, could you turn this fan on for me, please? So, verse 5. Casting down imaginations. We're talking about the battleground of the mind. Okay. And this is very specifically talking about things that will get in the way of you hearing the voice of God. Imaginations. Imaginations and thoughts that are exalting themselves above the knowledge of Christ. So, we established last week that the Word of God is forever settled in heaven. It's not going to change. You can want it to change. You can want it to be more convenient. You can want it to say something else that it doesn't say. But the Word of God is forever established. It is forever settled in heaven. Uh, thy word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven, David said. And so, uh, it's already said. It's a foregone conclusion that His Word is not going to change. But uh, we, uh, we, we still imagine things that are contrary to the Word of God. Right. We still have thoughts. And, and I don't, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands on this, but, but how many of us have ever privately, secretly, we probably wouldn't even want anyone to know this, and you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of us have ever in our lifetime had the thought, I wonder if God is real after all? <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if this is all just a fantasy. I wonder if those people are right that are saying that this is just all a fairy tale. I wonder in the deepest recesses of our mind, even though some of us were raised up, you know, learning the things of God, raised up in Pentecostal services. Again, the Israelites were in miracle after miracle after miracle. Yet there came a time where they said, well, surely God's brought us out here to kill us. <laughs> and, and so... So now, in the light of day, in the light of the Word of God, right here, right now, we would say, I, I, I'm, I'm mortified that I would have that thought because God has been so good to me. He has been better to me than, he's been, than I've been to myself. Amen. He laid down His life and He shed His blood. And here I'm having this thought, is God even real? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So, we have to come to the understanding that there are thoughts and imaginations that we will experience that are raising themselves up contrary to the knowledge of Christ and the Word of God. And this scripture, All right. if you're really studying that verse right there, it shows that we, that I have the power to determine how I'm going to think. We don't often come, entertain that concept. That's right. We just think, well, these thoughts are going to be coming. And there they are. Well, we can determine how we're going to think. That's right. That's what it says. Bringing every thought, every thought, yeah. 
Wow, have we thought, you mean when I'm daydreaming? You mean when I'm, uh, you know, every single thought, every single thought must be brought into subjugation, into captivity to the knowledge of Christ. God will never contradict his own word. Not now, not ever. God will never contradict his own word. So when that thought comes into your mind, no matter how strong it is, when that dread and that fear comes into your mind that is contrary to the word of God, you've got to pull that stronghold down and say, in the name of Jesus, I'm pulling that thought down and bringing it into captivity to the knowledge of Christ. I'm going to speak the name of Jesus and plead the blood of Jesus over my own mind because this is the battleground of the Spirit of God and the enemy. They're coming together to battle and, and our flesh is in there. This is the battleground that prevents us from hearing the Word of God, the oracle of God. So we must bring every thought into captivity to the knowledge of Christ. How do I know about Christ Unless I spend some time learning about him. Right. How do I learn about Christ? Just quickly, a couple things. How do I learn about Christ? Study the word. Study the word. Pray. Spend time in prayer. Pray. Somebody else. Praise. Go to church. Come into his presence. Let me just tell you something. Because, you know, we got there's a whole lot of people that say, well, I just spend time with the Lord and, you know, I just... We've got people that used to go to this church that don't go to church. Yeah. Right. They don't go to church. They may want to say it's... They want, want to put a pretty little spin on it. Well, I do this and I do this and I... But they flat out don't go to church. And Paul said, we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, even the more as the day approaches... Why? Because we need to be in the presence yes. of God. Why? Because we're going to get to it in the next verse. Uh, somebody read Romans 12.2. Did I give that one out? No. Yeah. Romans 12.2. Somebody get that one. Who who get that one? Sister Linda, get that one. Romans 12.2. 2 Timothy 3.13 and 14. Brother Dennis, would you get that? 2 Timothy 3.13 and 14. Um, uh, Brother Robert, would you get 2 Timothy 4.2 through 4? Okay, and then, uh, so we're casting down imaginations, and then, uh, Sister Jane, would you get 2 Corinthians 11, 3 for me? So we've got to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And that's why it's so important to know the voice of God and to know God is because there's people all over. Oh, God told me to tell you this. God said this. God, and you have to know, if, like you said, he will not contradict his word. That's right. That's right. And That's right. So, so we've got to spend time with him in his word, in his presence, private time in prayer, if we're going to know him. And how are we going to bring every thought into captivity to the knowledge of him if we don't know him? Right. Amen. So it is crucial. If you want to hear his voice, get to know him. Become close to him. Uh, now, I'm gonna, uh, I want everybody to, I know you're looking uh, at, at, for your scriptures and stuff, but I want everybody to pay attention to what I'm going to say right now. Because if you don't get anything else out of tonight, I want you to hear what I'm about to say. Okay? And Sister Jane, I'm going to ask you to read your scripture in just a minute. Not every thought that comes into your mind is the voice of God. Oh, Not every thought Amen. that comes into your mind is the voice of God. And I need to say it one more time because if you don't get anything else out of this, Amen. not every thought that comes into your mind is the voice of God. Go ahead and read your passage, 2 Corinthians 11, 3, Sister Jane. But I fear, lest by any means, that the serpent without Okay, so just as the serpent in the garden corrupted and deceived Eve, he's still out to deceive, but where is he going to attack? In our minds. Beguiled Eve through his subtility. 
So your minds should be corrupted from what? The simplicity that is in Christ. Now, this is important that you understand this. Hearing from God is not complicated. Hearing from God is not complicated. But Satan, everything that is true, he wants to corrupt it, right? He wants to pervert it. The gospel of Jesus Christ, what does he want to do? He wants to pervert that gospel. Everything that is true, he's out to counterfeit and corrupt it. So, the very simple communication that God has set up with you, he's out to corrupt that process, and he's trying to do that in your mind, so that your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Okay, uh, Romans 2, uh, 12 and 2, yeah, that's right. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All right, so be not conformed to the world, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute, but be transformed, and the way that that happens is only one way, to be transformed from the things of the world. We've got to be renewed in our mind. It's not enough to just be regenerated in our spirit. We've got to be renewed in our mind. And renewing, it, it's, it's speaking of a cycle. That means that you've got to have a continual process. That means that, that just because you got renewed on Sunday and felt the Spirit of God and you just had a breakthrough and, and you just, you know, God moved on you, that doesn't mean you're going to, you're good and you're set and that's all you need. That's all I need and I'm going to just go on. No, you've got to be in a continual cycle of renewal and renewing. And what, where is that happening? It's happening in your mind because this is the battleground uh, that the enemy is uh, fighting you on so that uh, he can intercept the messages that God wants to give to you. And so, um, somebody get Colossians 3.15 and somebody get that one, Brother Mark. And somebody else get 2 Timothy 1.7. Renee. Okay. 2 Timothy 1.7. Let's go to those quickly and then we'll go on to 2 Timothy 3. Please. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of the sound mind. Okay. And Colossians 3.15. I'm sorry, what about the eighth version? Colossians 3.15, it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the peace of God rule. That means that there are other uh, powers that are vying for the throne in your heart, in your mind. But let the peace of God rule in your heart, to the which... Also, ye are called. So, here's something that we need to establish right here and now. God's voice will always bring about peace. Amen. Wow. Yes. Okay. Wow. If you're Amen. writing, write that in big old letters. <laughs> because this is one of the most important tests that you can ever apply to the voices that are speaking. Okay. God's voice. Now, how many have had an experience where God told you something you didn't really want to hear? In fact, most of the time, when I go to church and I hear somebody preach, some of that message is stepping on my toes, at least some of it. <laughs> it's called conviction. Right. God speaking to us sometimes comes in the form of conviction. Right. It's God's uh, God's voice, his word coming into a, a collision course with my flesh. That's what conviction is. Yet, even in that process, even when God is telling me something I don't want to hear, even when God is correcting me, I still will have peace if it's from God. And that's the difference. I'm not going to spend time on this because I've, I've been talking about it a lot. But that's the difference in conviction and condemnation. Yes, right. And condemnation is not from God. It is not from God. 
and a lot of churches try to pass off condemnation as some message from God. It never was from God. It's not from God. Hallelujah. Condemnation makes you feel about this big. Yep. Anybody ever heard a message sitting in the pew and all of a sudden you just begin to feel smaller and smaller and more condemned and more hopeless and just all of a sudden you didn't want to go to the altar. You wanted to, you know, just go find a razor blade or something. I mean, it's just like, wow, that message makes me feel like there's no hope for me. Anybody else ever feel that? That is not the spirit of God. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Conviction, even though it crosses my spirit, or crosses my flesh rather, conviction will bring the power of God to life in me because God's voice is always going to generate peace and blessing and he's, he's about raising me up and, and, and lifting me up. He's not about putting me down. Amen. Jesus himself said he didn't Right. So that condemnation is not the voice of God. And we've got to learn to distinguish that. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. I'm, I'm really trying to, we've got a lot to cover, but I'm, I'm trying to move ahead here. <laughs> the time is getting late. Uh, okay, so uh, so we need to, to establish that, that God's voice will always, always, always bring peace. If you don't have peace, if you think you've heard from God, and you don't have peace, you better get down on your knees and hear, uh, try to hear again. Or you better, we're going to talk about confirming the word of God in just a moment. 2 Timothy 3, 13 and 14. There's a warning. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. All right, so there's a whole bunch in this, and um, unfortunately we don't have time to get uh, into it very deeply. But uh, I want to ask you, uh, if, if we have to distinguish the voice of the stranger versus the voice of the shepherd, that means that other people are speaking, right? There are other voices speaking, yes. according to the Word of God, according, according to Jesus, right. right? If we have to establish... Uh, knowing his voice, the voice of the shepherd, and, and said they're not going to follow the stranger. That means the stranger is speaking. Yeah. That's right. The stranger is speaking. So I want to ask the question, who else is speaking? Scripture is going to answer that for us. The first scripture that Brother Dennis already read to us is that evil men are going to wax worse and worse. So evil, seducing, deceiving, and deceived men are going to speak to us in the last days, the Word of God says. And so we need to be aware that not everybody that supposedly speaks for God is hearing from God. Evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse. That means become worse and worse. It doesn't mean they're going to you know, do a horrible job on the floor or something. It, it means that they're going to become worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And, and so uh, if they're deceived themselves then I better identify that because I don't want to hear what they have to say. If they're, if they're, the most dangerous individual is somebody who believes what they're saying, oh, yeah. who is deceived. That's the most dangerous individual because they're going to be zealots of false doctrine. They're going to be zealots of doctrines of devils and seducing spirits. And so we need to be uh, just absolutely aware that there are people that are speaking uh, and they are not speaking for God. It said, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now, I'm going to introduce quickly a concept called established word. Established word. We know the logos is established. We've already talked about that. The written word, the scripture is established. But there is such a thing as the established 
oracles of God, the established utterances of God. Now, how do we know that uh, something is established? We're going to talk about that. So I just want to uh, introduce that established word. And basically, this, that's what the scripture is saying, is that you need to uh, go to that place where you have received established word. Go to that place where something has been authenticated in your life. If you have a man of God or a woman of God, and, and it is the will of God that you're in a church with a pastor, that's why you have elders, that's why you have pastors, that's why you have deacons. That's why you have teachers and all the ministries that are in the church. It's because God speaks through people and he authenticates his word. And so when he has established his word and you have that uh, assurance, those things that you've been assured of, verse 14 said, that's where you need to stay. That's the, the, the trust that you need to establish and you need to continue to hear from them. And I've said it many times when people will question me and question me as a pastor, whether I'm following where I need to be, I tell them, and I don't, I'm not saying this in an ugly way to them. I say, well, if you don't believe that I'm hearing from God, then you need to go and find a pastor that you can have confidence in, whose walk with God you have confidence in, that when they get up and preach the word of God, you feel that you can receive something Amen. and don't have to be on guard and worry about it. As a matter of fact, I'll tell everybody in this church that you better, you better not follow somebody just because they're leading. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So if anybody, even in this leadership team, stops following Christ, not only do you have permission from the Word of God, but you have a mandate from the Word of God that you better stop following them. Because I, I don't, I, I'm not interested in anybody following someone right off a cliff just because they're, they want to follow somebody. No, we follow our leaders as they follow Christ. Amen. So... Uh, Let's see. So who's speaking to us? Evil men and women are speaking to us who are deceived and who are out to deceive. Second Timothy 4, 2 through 4. Preach the word. Be, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, mm -hmm. and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned into fables. Okay, so not only are evil deceived and deceiving men and women speaking in this day and age, but there's got to be a market for it. Yeah. There's, got to be, uh, there's got to be a desire for it, and that's what the word says. It is fleshly lust that is causing the people to heap up to themselves to bring into prominence these deceiving people because there's a market for it. It's, it's supply and demand. There's not going to be a, a, a glut of all of these evil speaking people unless there are followers that are demanding this and that following comes from uh, lust and fleshly desire. People wanting to that have itching ears, the word said. They just want to hear what they want to hear. I said it on Sunday, the way that a lot of churches get rid of the sin problem is they simply stop preaching sin. The way they get rid of the judgment problem is they don't preach judgment anymore. And the way they get rid of the word problem, because after a while you just got to throw the whole thing out, uh, is you just quit preaching the word altogether. But Absolutely. And so, so this is what Paul was saying to Timothy. He said, preach the word. That's what this started with. Preach the word. If you can't figure out anything else to preach, then preach the word. Don't, you don't have to come up with fancy stories and allegories and, and uh, all of these things to make it pretty. Just preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. And here's why. It's because in the last days, fleshly lusts. And those fleshly lusts in your life, believe it or not, those things are speaking to you on a constant, uh, continual basis. They're speaking to you. Sometimes our desires that are ungodly. How many know that ungodly desires don't mean horrible, sinful desires? They just mean uh, desires that get in the way of what God wants for you. The, I, I, there are people that belong in this church right now that God has spoken to them over and over and over and over again 
through, and I was present for a lot of those times. And I'm not going to name names, but it's not rocket science. There are people that God has spoken through his word, through his preached word, spoken through prophecy, spoken through, you know, not just once, but over and over and over again. And then God brings in somebody that doesn't even know who they are and speaks to them again. And where are they today? Because their lust and their fleshly desires were speaking to them louder and they didn't distinguish the voice of God and they had more of a desire for the fleshly lust in yeah. their lives than they did for the things of God. Oh, listen, I, God is, is, is dealing with me. I'm probably going to preach on it uh, very <laughs> shortly. But God is dealing with me about what it means to be a minister of God. And it's not about just walk in the path that you want to walk but God is going to speak to you and he's going to first just like he did the disciples he's going to say you've got to leave everything behind and come and follow me if you want to be my disciple it's not going to work any other way Hallelujah. so there are fleshly lusts I want this so bad. And listen, I'm going to just get real with you. It can be wanting a girlfriend or a boyfriend. I've seen people walk away from ministry. I've seen people walk away right out of the church because they couldn't get the man or the woman that they wanted in their life. So they said, I'm going to go get what I want because that desire is greater in my life than wanting to walk with God. Now, here's the sad truth. He said, I'll give you the desires of your heart if you just delight yourself in me. And the sad truth is those individuals didn't listen to the voice of God. They could have had everything. They could have had every desire in their heart, plus a ministry, plus a, a relationship with God. But Satan came in and he began to magnify things above the voice of God. And so they walked on out and they're not even serving God today because they insisted on their fleshly desires and achieving their fleshly lust. It might be a job. You may think, I, I, I've got to have this job. I've got to have this situation in my life. I've got to go to school somewhere. Julie is here today yeah. because she began to pray and say, God, what would you have me to do? And God spoke to her and she said, if it, if it means that I have to give this up, my dream, my hopes. God, I want you more. God, I want you more. I want you more. I want you more than anything. That's what it's going to take if we want to walk in the places that God has called us to. Hearing the voice of God is crucial to you and me because God is calling us to higher places of power and anointing and ministry. And God is speaking to people who want to hear his voice. Yes. Yes. There may be people with anointing, but what good is that anointing if they can't bring themselves to even obey the voice of God? Your anointing isn't worth anything because the only way the anointing, listen, the anointing is freely given. You don't earn that anointing, but that anointing isn't going to do any good for you or anybody else in your life unless you pick up your cross and say, I'm going to crucify my flesh. I'm going to walk in obedience to God. Your anointing will not be an active part of your life. God will not be able to use you to the capacity that he's called you because you've got to walk in obedience. Amen. And obedience costs you something. Amen. Costs you something. Just one second, Brother Dennis, and I'll call on you. Listen, I, 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 this is, uh, it, it, it tears my heart in pieces to see people come up in this church tears streaming down pastor this is where God has sent me and God speak to him and God just perform miracle after miracle after miracle but just because it doesn't come together in their time frame they turn on a dime and walk away from the things of God walk away from the anointing of God it tears my heart out And I can't do anything about it. And you can't do anything about it. Because God is not going to overpower somebody's free will. At the bottom of all sin is the insistence upon the right to ourselves. That's right. And according to scripture, the only real right we have is those that receive him have the right to become 
children of God. Right. That's the only right that's really spelled out in Scripture. Christians have no rights except that to become a child of God. The bottom of all sin is the insistence of having a right to myself. That's, that's right. What you're essentially covering. Paul said we're bought with a price. Yes. Yep. Right. You're not your own. No. Right. That's what Brother Dennis just said. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Yep. You were purchased. Yeah. Amen. Therefore, you're not your own. <laughs> so you, you you can't you can't give God something that already belongs to Him. Yet He allows us free will. Right. Imagine that He allows us free will. Amen. So now I'm going to just go ahead and we need to get through these scriptures quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and just read them. But if you want to turn with me uh, to so we've established that evil men. And your fleshly lusts are speaking. Those are two of the three that I'm going to talk about. The third is 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. What? 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. And it says this. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared, with a hot iron. So the third voice or group of voices that is speaking to you is something that the word calls seducing spirits. <clears throat> seducing spirits. If you think God is real and you think angels are real, I think, I don't know, there's something like 98% of the country thinks that angels are real and, and like 75% believe in God. Go figure that out. I mean, we are how, right. how are angels real if God's not real? But, but if, we, if we believe <laughs> angels are real, then we must believe, by the, by the same token, that evil spirits are real. Because right. demons are nothing but fallen angels. Right. And uh, so, we, you know, I, I don't think we ought to stop uh, short of talking about demonic activity uh -huh. uh, when we talk about the Word of God. Why? Because it's part of the Word of God. Right. And so seducing spirits are demonic spirits, and some people get all freaked out. This is another thing that you won't hear in a whole lot of, uh, right. uh, of right. congregations today, because right. ministers think they sound ridiculous when they talk about the Word of God. There is evil in the world. Yeah. There is a, a, a host of evil spirits that have been assigned to take you down. Yeah. There is right. a Satan who the Word of God has said, said is roaming to and fro, right. seeking whom he may devour. And so there are evil spirits that want to speak to you. But here's a test in verse 2. They're going to, number one, they're always going to speak lies. Right. So if you know the truth, the truth is always going to set you free. Right. Hallelujah. But they're also, now here's, here's one that's, uh, that, that we don't talk about as much. They speak lies in hypocrisy. So, uh, oh, I wish I had time for this. But, but here's another test that we need to apply. Is that person that is preaching that word speaking in hypocrisy? Mm. Right. Is that spiritual message that is coming through, are they speaking in hypocrisy? And if they are, you better watch out. Because the, the enemy comes in through hypocrisy. That's why it's important. The, the, Paul said that we've got to work, walk worthy of the vocation and calling wherewith God has called us. That's why it, it's, yeah, God can speak through a donkey if he wants to, but he's called the blood bought to, to speak and to preach the gospel. And we've got to walk worthy. We've got to walk in a genuine uh, experience with the Lord because we don't want to be confused with those who are spreading false doctrine and doctrines of devils, the word calls it, doctrines of devils, uh, this false doctrine. But we can always tell because 100% of the time they're walking in hypocrisy. Okay, I can't elaborate any further on that. I need to move on. Uh, okay, so that was uh, 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter. And those are the three groups that I wanted to talk about that are speaking to you. 1 John 4, 1, if you want to turn there with me. 1 John 4 and 1. So if there are spirits that are speaking, and the Spirit of God is also speaking, how am I supposed to distinguish between these spiritual communications that are coming to me if I'm being bombarded by all of these things? And here's what John had to say in 1 John 4 and chapter 1. Beloved, sounds like Brother Dennis, yep. believe, it, uh, believe not every spirit, right. Amen. but... 
try the spirits, whether they be of God. Because many false prophets are gone out yes. in the world. Yes. So, now, I want to establish something very clear to you. You have, and I've said this before, in, in when somebody, when a person is speaking to you and they go off track, then you have not only the right, but you have a mandate to get out from under that person uh, as your leader. But the Word of God says that we have the right and we also have the, the responsibility to try the spirits. Right. Try the spirits. Don't just accept any kind of message. Right. And I'm going to talk uh, about the, uh, the gifts of the Spirit because Satan will work through counterfeit uh, gifts of the Spirit. And I, I don't want to get into it tonight, but we're going to deal with that next week. But you have the right and responsibility to question the message that you hear coming to you. I'm not saying you didn't hear a message. Right. I'm not saying that you're crazy and you're just making things up. Now, there are imaginations, and we've got to bring those into captivity. Those stray thoughts have to be brought into captivity. But there are messages that are going forth, and we better try the spirits to see whether they be of God. Our primary method and means of doing that is you better compare that message to the logos, the written word of God. And when you got done uh, uh, comparing it to the logos, the written word of God, the scripture, then you need to... To also compare it to the established word of God. To the established word of God. Try the spirits to see whether they be of God. Uh, verse 4 says this. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Uh, so we don't need to fear, even though we have demonic spirits speaking to us. You know, most of our friends would just be horrified. What? Demons are speaking to you? What are you talking about? <laughs> but it's part of the situation that we find ourselves in. Yet in the same passage in verse 4, he said, You are of God, little children. You've overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I want to tell you that you don't have to fear not one second, not one moment, because the Holy Ghost inside of you is greater than the spirit yes. of deception, is greater than the seducing spirits that have been loosed in this last day. Verse 5 said, They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world heareth them. Yeah. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby, now listen, this is important. This part says, verse 6, it says, Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay, we've not been given the spirit of the world, but we've been given the spirit of truth. So if, if it's a doctrine, if it's a message that is readily accepted by the world, you better watch. You better discern. You better compare. Because if the world is receiving it, then that's the litmus test. If the world is readily receiving this time, there happens to be a pope, a brand new pope in office in the Catholic Church. And groups that have been completely, now I'm not Catholic, but, but groups that have been anti-Catholic as long as I've been alive, people that have just ridiculed the Pope and ridiculed Catholic doctrine are now coming forward and embracing and, and just saying what a wonderful man of God this is and receiving everything he has to say. You better check the source of the message that right. is being preached when the world comes forward and begins celebrating someone who is supposedly speaking the word of God. Now that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, so that's our litmus test. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. If the world is able to receive the supposed Gospel, the supposed doctrine that your church is teaching and preaching, the supposed uh, interpretation of the Word of God, then you're off track, my friend, and you better get on your knees and you better hear from God for yourself because the message that comes from the Spirit of God is not even accessible to the world because they cannot discern it. It's spiritually discerned. All right. So... Uh, we need to go on to the next verse. <laughs> Dear Jesus, help me. <laughs> Don't be afraid, uh, because greater is he that is in you than he yes. that is in the yes. world. First Amen. Corinthians 2.12. 1 Corinthians 2.12. Yes. Now ye have received not the spirit of the world, but 
the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now, I want to say something very, very clear. God wants you to clearly discern His voice. God is not interested in, in you not being able to hear his voice. One thing that I found is that God doesn't waste his words. Right. In fact, he said that, uh, that my word is going to, I think we already read the scripture, that my word is going to go forth and it's not going to return void. It's going to accomplish the things that I determine and the things that please me. So God does not waste his word. So why would God want to speak to us in some ambiguous, uh, murky way? No, God speaks firmly. God speaks clearly. God speaks boldly, but he speaks in a still small voice. It is his desire that you hear his voice, that you discern his voice. So, uh, so we haven't received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, verse 13, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things to spiritual, verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the, the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, right. because they are spiritually discerned. So if you're trying to compare the message of the voice of the Spirit of God to natural things, it's never going to work because we've got to compare spiritual things to spiritual things. That's why we must always compare everything to the Word of God. And we're going to get to the established uh, oracles of God as well. So uh, that was... Uh, Let's see, we're in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Let's turn to Isaiah, the 28th chapter. And so now, I've been talking about established word, and here's where we're going to see that. We've got a few, just a, a, a few more scriptures left. Isaiah 28 and verse 10. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line. Line upon line. I'm not stuttering. It's, it actually says it over and over again. <laughs> Here a little and there a little. Okay, are you ready for this? This is another concept that I really want you to get. God's uh, uttered word, the oracles of God. God's word is cumulative. God's word is cumulative. God is not erratic. God is not schizophrenic. God doesn't say one thing on one day, change his mind and say something else on another day. Right. And, get this, the word that God is speaking to you is perfect. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. Think about that for just a minute. And that's all the time we have. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so if God's word is perfect, wow, what power there is in understanding that. That God's word that he is speaking to me is perfect. If I can just clear away the fog and clear away the clutter and hear his word, his word to me is perfect. It's perfect. So, but, but I need to understand that his word is cumulative. That's why I've got to compare it to his established word. Now, if, if I have received a prophecy from somebody else, mm -hmm. or God has spoken to me, and we're going to get to this next week, but when other people, God speaks to, uh, he has a relationship with you as his sheep. <coughs> and it's a direct relationship. He said, my sheep know my voice. <coughs> he didn't say that I'm going to bring a sheep interpreter, and that sheep <laughs> interpreter is going to have to be with them all the time, because when I speak, they're going to have to interpret my voice. No. God is speaking directly to you right. because he has a direct relationship with you. you. Therefore, when you hear through other means and through other people, it is simply for confirmation yeah. of what God is already speaking directly to you. The devil doesn't want you to hear this tonight, but if you can get a hold of this, God is speaking to you directly. And when somebody else is operating through the, the legitimate uh, other gifts and, and the legitimate other uh, passages of, of God's word, it is only for confirmation of what God is speaking directly to you. I tell people that. This is to confirm what God has showed you. 
Amen. So, uh, so if God has confirmed his word, whether it be through other means or through uh, scripture, then that becomes established word. When I can uh, receive it in my spirit and it's begin, it, it has been confirmed, that, begin, that becomes established word, okay? And that established word is like a, a brick that goes into position. And then God will speak to me. How many know he's not going to contradict what he's already established and spoken to your spirit? He's not going to tell you one thing on one occasion and something completely different on another occasion. Right. Amen. So if you're hearing something that goes against established oracles of God, then you better recheck what you're hearing. Jeremiah 1 and verse 12. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Hasten, that word hasten means I will watch over my word. I watch over my word. So why, why would we bring this scripture up? It's because it is a process. God speaks his word and then he watches over his word in the process of performing it. So uh, he, he's not just going to drop a word on you and then forget what he said. Right. He's not going to give you a promise and then forget all about what he said. But he's hastening his word. He's bringing his word to pass. Uh, that's why he says that my word is not going to go uh, to return void unto me. It's going to accomplish that which I please. And so we, we need to uh, take note of the established word of God. 2 Corinthians 13.1 talking about established word. 2 Corinthians 13, 1, it said this. This is the third time I'm coming to you, Paul said. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So when you think you've heard from God, there is absolutely nothing wrong, especially if you've just begun the process. There's nothing wrong with, number one, try the spirits. Number two, compare it to, uh, you need to receive some confirmation on that word. There is nothing wrong with seeking confirmation of the word that you are receiving from God. And let every word be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Again, God has put you in a church with some mature Christian brothers and sisters, with leadership that has been through some things and has uh, walked in places of having to learn to hear from God. You've got pastors and elders and deacons and teachers. and So there's nothing wrong with, with coming to somebody and saying, I, I feel like God is speaking something to me and I just want to get a confirmation. Again, not every thought that comes through your mind is the word of God. Right. And so, again, we talked about last week uh, small successes and learning to distinguish the voice of God through small successes, small challenges. God is not, not going to ask you to do something just, just beyond the veil and just, right. you know, the... The, the uh, example that was given in the story that we started with was the voice came forward and said, I want you to give all of your cash to the next person that walks in the door. I've had things like that go through my mind before. As a matter of fact, God has allowed me to fall flat on my face following after voices that weren't him. When I was a teenager, I was convinced that God spoke to me to give everything in my pocket in the offering. And so guess what? I reached in, I gave every bit of money that I had in my pocket. Part of that money was gas money that I needed. And so I thought, well, then I guess God is just going to let me run on fumes. And so I'll just go ahead and give it. And, but guess what? God didn't have anything to do with that because I ran out of gas. And God let me run out of gas. Why? Because he's not responsible for other voices that tell you to do something harebrained that he didn't have anything to do with. Now, there may come a time that God tells me to do something, but I better learn to distinguish. And he loves you enough that he's going to let you fall flat on your face by following a stranger because he knows that down the road it could be something more serious like those that have said God told me to kill somebody. You see how it can get a little more serious. 
there, uh, we don't even have time to go through them, but, but Charles Manson and, you know, just all these, these murderers, a lot of them said, God told me, God spoke to me and told me to kill someone. I remember going to New York City and, and uh, wanted to go out on the ferry to go out to the Statue of Liberty and they had the ferry closed down because God had spoken to somebody supposedly to kill everyone on the ferry. And so they walked on there with a machete and just started slashing people up. Well, guess what? God didn't tell that person to grab a machete and go on that boat. But they, for whatever reason, they thought that that voice, they didn't check the voice. They didn't have the, the, the equipping and the, the furnishing to check that voice. So you see how a small failure could be your best friend right. in distinguishing the voice of God and something else. Okay, so, so we, need to, uh, we need to check and confirm the word of God. Uh, so uh, one last scripture, Proverbs eleven fourteen. Proverbs eleven fourteen. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. There is safety. God never intended for you to walk this path by yourself. Never intended for you to walk by yourself. He didn't even intend for you to walk it with just you and him. And those that say, oh, I just have my relationship with the Lord. Well, you're a fool. You're a fool. Because he established the church. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And so if you think that he's going to build a church and, and, and it's just something that, you know, God does everything with purpose. And so yeah. there is a purpose in uh, the, the leadership and, and the even, even just in my relationships with my brothers and my sisters. There are going to be times that I need you to pick me up because I'm just not strong enough. And I, I may fall. I may trip. I may fall. And so I'm going to need somebody to help me and to pick me up. And that's what God has given to us. What an incredible gift to have a church full of people that love me yes, amen. And, and are concerned with me. And not just concerned with the here and now. They're concerned with my eternity. Right. Right. Yes, concerned amen. with my, my goodness. Thank concerned you, with my eternity. Amen. And so there is, there, God has established this relationship that I have with my brothers and sisters. And so counsel is going to be uh, something that we need to get used to. We need to understand that no man has the ability to make it all by himself. Right. No man has the ability to understand all by himself. God put into place... A system where we have all kinds of different, and we're not going to go into this, but but he said that we're all different parts of the body of Christ, fitly joined together. We've got we've got different parts. We've got the head, we've got the eyes, we've got the mouth, we've got all the, the, the feet and the legs, and every part of the body is fitly joined together. We need each other. And so we need to seek and receive counsel, godly counsel, because the word of God tells us there's safety in godly. Counsel. So just to recap uh, a, a few things to test, how do I know this is God? What are the test questions? Number one, is it scriptural? Compare it to the word of God. Is it scriptural? If it doesn't pass the scripture test, throw it back because it's not God. Number two, does it harmonize with prior established oracles of God or utterances of God? Does it harmonize with prior established oracles of God? Number three, do I have peace? Just ask that simple question. Do you know how, how that simple question will, will yes. keep you from yes. so much yes. pain and oh, so yeah. many mistakes? Oh, yeah. If you just ask the question, yep. do I have peace? Number four, has there been confirmation? Has there been confirmation? Have I sought confirmation from one of the methods that we talked about tonight? Number five, does it bring me closer to God? Because if it doesn't, I promise you, it's not God. He's not going to speak to you and instruct you in something that brings you away from your ability to get closer to Him. Well, but I think I can, I can make it just, you know, without a church to go to, so I'm just going to move off somewhere. No, that wasn't God. 
that wasn't God because number one, it's against his scripture. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves right. together. Number two, hey, that's not going to draw you closer. You may think in your own lusts and your own, uh, you know, all the voices that we talked about that that's going to be something that you can do. But you're not going to be the first one to make it that way. You're not going to be the first one to make it. God has established a pathway to victory for you and a pathway to discipleship, a pathway to ministry, a pathway to anointing. You're not going to be the first one to go around his established pathway. Amen. Amen. Some people say, well, I, I stay home and, and I listen to, to the preachers or da 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 But the, the scripture says we need to come together because when we come together, then we... we um, encourage one another in the faith and, right. and build up one another. You can't do it if you're home by yourself. That's right. Sure. Listen to some TV That's right. And Sister Evelyn, I know you'll agree because, because Sister Evelyn, to her credit, will call her pastor. And I'm younger than her. I know that it doesn't look like it, but I'm <laughs> younger than her. <laughs> She's been preaching a long time. She has been walking with God a long time. And yet she will call her pastor when she's wanting, she's wondering about something. When she's seeking after confirmation, she will call her pastor. Why? Because she's a woman of the word. And because this is what God has laid out before her. I will seek, I, I am the pastor of this church. And Sister Evelyn has pastored, Brother Dennis has pastored. I am the pastor of this church. Yes. Yet I have, I'm subject to the word of God. Just because I think I'm something and I've walked with God, you know, all these years. Doesn't mean that I'm not subject to the, the, the process that God has put in place. Right. So you see, that's why the exercising of the principles of the oracles of God will bring you to a place of absolute ironclad being able to hear from God every time. You're not going to be deceived. God has put a process in place for you to hear and to distinguish between the, the voices of error and the voices of truth. Yes. Amen. Yes. So you know what? All I have to do is follow after what God has put in his word and, and his instruction that he's given to me. And I don't have to anguish over hearing his voice. I can know beyond any doubt if I simply apply the principles of the oracles of God. And so next week we're going to talk about the, the processes that God has put in place for me hearing for other people. And that can get a little bit scary for people, but we're going to, don't, you know, you're not going to have to worry about that either, but you're going to find out how to operate and to, in, in a place of ministry and confirmation and hearing for other people. So is there anything, uh, I know that this is kind of, been, we've covered a lot uh, and uh, tried to get through it as quickly as we could, but is there anybody that wanted to share something before we're dismissed? Yes. Okay, so um, since I started school, which is going great, by the way, um, I've been kind of feeling a little bit more sad about not going to my dream school. And the past two weeks, Pastor has spoken about me not going to my dream school and having and being in God's will right now by being home. And my AMDA pen just ran out of ink. And I think that's really awesome because now I can throw it away and not have to think about it anymore. It's a great testimony, I guess. But it's just like, it, it's awesome because God is using pastor to remind me, this is where I want you to be right now, Julie. This is awesome. So thank you for speaking the, that word. Amen. You know, God, it, 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 it is amazing hearing the voice of God. I, uh, you know, Brother Chris will remember his and Billy's first service. I, I, I actually, I had met them years before, and they'd been corresponding and saying, we're going to come and visit, and, and uh, but I completely forgot about it, the, the Sunday that they showed up. I completely forgot about it, and I didn't recognize them, and I thought, oh, we've got visitors, and yet... God would not leave me alone in that service. I mean, I kept trying to go through our little agenda and go from this to that. And God kept saying that I'm confirming something to someone right now. And, and yeah. so I wanted to ignore it and say, well, that's great. Thank you, Lord. For doing that for that one. Isn't that great? That's great for them. And, 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 but God, he wouldn't leave me alone. I keep, I want to go on. Okay, let's take the offering now. God would say, I'm confirming something for someone right now. And, and he didn't tell me who it was or any of that. And, and so finally I said, okay, God. 
and I, I just said, God won't leave me alone. And he wants you to know he's confirming something to you right now. Now, that may seem like kind of a, a you know, ambiguous to you. It might sound like some kind of, you know, you know, the psychic tricks about, oh, yeah. does that mean anything to you? And it's a letter <laughs> starting with, have you seen the EFG? You know, you know, those tricks. <laughs> but, but see, when God speaks to an individual, through an individual, there is, uh, something resonates in your spirit. And so immediately, they knew what I was talking about. And then after, they said, oh, pastor, you know, it was us. God confirmed. Then it was like, oh, I remember who they are. <laughs> Actually, it was me. Uh, it just resonated so strong. Right after service, I said, so we're moving. Mm -hmm. He's like, <laughs> he did his thing. <laughs> but he got it a week later, but anyway. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and this, is, this is so awesome that there is so much interest in this, because this is the basis, just like Brother Dennis was saying, there's nothing more important, any more important than uh, what we're studying right now in your ability to move into the, the higher things of God yeah. and into yeah. ministry and into operating Ooh, in your yeah. gifts. And I say your gifts because God's already given them yeah. to you. Yeah. You yeah. simply haven't uh, exercised them and allowed them to come forward. Right. Yes? Oh, I was going to say, um, and I'm sorry to stand up, but I couldn't see you. I remember a few years ago, I was uh, in my house. I was, it was probably about 8 o'clock at night. I was living down in Louisiana where I'm from, a small town. And it was just a real quiet, still week, weeknight. I was working in, in the kitchen, doing something, and I remember that the Lord spoke to me, and he said, he said, I want you to go take a walk and start praying. And here it is, dark, and, and I said, this has got to be the craziest idea. So um, I just kind of shrugged it off and kept working, and I was really involved in what I was doing, and then the Lord said, I want you to go out and take a walk. He kept saying that to me. Finally, I went outside, and I just started walking down the street and praying in the Spirit. And I saw this drunk guy coming down the street, and the Holy Spirit said, there's your man. And so I walked up to him, and I just kind of struck up a conversation about, about the Lord. And come to find out, of course, he was drunk. <laughs> but he was uh, really involved in a Pentecostal church and had fallen into sin mm -hmm. and was out drinking and I remember I was trying to talk to him, and he kept taking sips of his beer, and pretty soon I noticed he was looking in the glass, and he was trying to look down, and he said, this beer tastes nasty, and he threw it at him, and he listened to me. Wow. Wow. Amen. God is speaking to every one of us, and so... I hope that this is creating a desire in you to cultivate that relationship with God so that you can begin to hear like you've never heard. Every one of us needs this. Every one of us, I need this. The Shaves, Pastor Morgan, every, Brother Glenn has been serving God for a long time and in ministry for a long time. And, and but, but every one of us needs to uh, seek after a, a, a greater clarity. And I said this last week, you know, Brother Tony uh, operates in the gifts of the Spirit. And there are gifts that God allows in certain people. But so many times uh, we, we look at people like that and we say, oh, well, that's just some special dispensation. No, God wants to operate through every single one of us to that level and greater. Amen. It's simply that some people get quiet and, and exercise their senses, as the Word said. And so all of us... Uh, have the ability to be used by hearing the voice of God. All of us do. We have an unction to hear from God. We have an unction, a specific anointing. You have it, I have it, and the enemy cannot take it away. Amen. Well, I always pray before we leave on a trip, flying or have to go to airports. Uh, I always say, God, give me a divine appointment. Mm -hmm. You know what? He never fails. And I, I have to recognize it. Sure. Oh, this is it. This is it. Mm -hmm. And the flight attendants were this last <laughs> They were it. <laughs> and they thank you for sharing with them. You know, so. I remember a divine appointment where the Lord put Dennis in the hospital. 
<laughs> and you started ministering to the person in the bed next to him <laughs> in the ER. Yeah. <laughs> and we never, I never did see him. Yeah. Just our voices. Wow. It was really something. It was really something. Well, I went over there. Yeah, <laughs> she, I would lay down on the gurney. Yeah. I'm going to have to give you then, because you've encouraged me, <laughs> to give you what I believe God is telling me right now. It's a, in a sense, I suppose, it's an admonishment, and I was going to get you off by yourself to, to share this. But I think the rest of the people need to hear this. This is too important to rush through. Right. And several times you, you've said here tonight, oh, I wish I had time for mm -hmm. I have, and, and God wants me to tell you, my beloved pastor, <laughs> you do have the time. And to encourage you to uh, maybe take another look at your schedule of teaching and expand this. You have as much time as you need. We need, we need, the, your heart is so full, Lord. Brother, that you you can't, and I know the topic you're bringing up next week, and, and I'm going to tell you right no, here, no, you cannot finish it next week. No. <laughs> you, can't, you might need two, three, four more weeks just on the topic for next week, and then going back and revisiting some of this stuff. Right. Uh, you have uh, you poured a lot on us tonight, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not sure. I don't speak for anybody else, but I'm not sure everybody can digest as much as you've given us here. And to consider praying, asking God how to revise your schedule so you can expand this. Even if it takes two months more, three months more. The church, certainly pray about this that. is a foundation for the church here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. For many future years. Yeah. Yeah, and if, if you can get the broad outlines of what I'm talking about, then it, it will change your life. And we have gone through a lot, but that's why I'm being emphatic on certain points, because <laughs> we're talking about principles. Any, anybody else? Uh, I know it's kind of getting late here, and we need to dismiss, but is there anybody else that wanted to share? Brother Rogers? Well, actually, two things. You would, earlier you were talking about um, checking um, when, when you're under somebody's authority, or pastor, or whoever it might be, and checking what they're preaching, what they're teaching, with you know what you know is the word of God. Mm -hmm. um, well, I was going to a Pentecostal church <laughs> in um, Maryland or D.C. area, and um, the person that was the pastor of this particular church came out of UPC. When I got him alone and started talking to him about UPC and all this other stuff and started. You know, I said, you know, I just, I told him, I said, I need a church that believes in Acts 2.38. I said, because that is the foundation. That is what I believe, and that is what I am searching for. And when this person turned around and said that they no longer preach that as the planet salvation, some, you know, the alarms were going off in me, like 100%, but yet I continued to go to give them an opportunity. And I finally just had to realize that I, I could not condone, you know, because to, to me, when I sat there every single Sunday, and as long as I went, I was, I was basically saying that I support that, that he's saying that this is not the truth. And I had to walk away. And although it did leave me without a church, I'm here now. <laughs> and that was, and then that was the other thing is that when I came here talking about confirmation, something spoke to me and said, you know, I, I had planned to go to several churches in the valley, and something spoke to me and said, you know that old song say, you know them by my love? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I walked into this church, I, I swear that every single one of you came up to me and talked to me. And it made me feel so welcome. And it was that 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 just spoke to me mm -hmm. and confirmed and made a confirmation that this was the church that God was bringing. Amen. Amen. And, and of course, we can't even begin to uh, overstate the importance of that love. And this church is awesome with that. 
But I've been in churches where they acted like they didn't even want me there. Right. Guess what? I didn't go back. Uh -huh. They don't want me there. I don't want to be there. <laughs> and uh, I literally have. I've been in churches where they, they had disdain for me even walking in the door. And uh, so I appreciate hearing that because that, that just uh, reinforces in all of us how important that is. Anybody else? All right. Thank you so much.